you please join me in the call to remembrance? We gather this morning to remember and to celebrate the lives of persons we name as saints. Loved ones now resting in you, who guided us, nurtured and cared for us, ancestors who worked and traveled, lived and died that we might be who we are, where we are, your precious children in this community of believers. We thank you for your example. We praise you for your lives of faith, for all your saints the Lord, who now continue to reign and reign with you. You may be seated. I'll call your attention to the insert in the bulletin and just to make a note that George Gibson did uh, pass away on October 29th and his service will be held here, memorial service, this Friday. <clears throat> we often talk about the church as a community. In our Western individualized society, it's sometimes hard to realize just how interrelated we are with other people. And yet our lives are intertwined with the lives of others in ways that we are sometimes unaware. Whether we like to admit it or not, we are social creatures. We also sometimes like to think that we are who we are because we have worked hard to make ourselves this way. Yet, if we are honest, much of what we are as human beings, we owe to other people, especially in the church. Most of us have fathers and mothers in the faith. Sometimes those are our own parents. Sometimes they are people who loved us and were patient with us when we were teenagers. Some were teachers, pastors, youth ministers, Sunday school teachers, who in small or large ways helped us grow and nurtured us in life and in faith. We always stand in a larger community than just those who are around us daily. For those who are older, many of those people who shaped our spiritual journey are gone now. On this All Saints Day, the church calls us to remember our father and mothers in the faith, and we truly are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, the church and its people across the centuries that were faithful to God and to us. This is a time of recognizing and honoring those who have passed on before us. And so at this time, our deacons and elders will come forward and will name off the role of the honored dead one at a time, following which a candle will be lit and the chime will toll. Jim Rempe. Deanna Meeker. Robert Vogel. Janet Spencer. Larry Schaff. Dick Armstrong. Arthur Cook. Treva Clappen. Wilma Cathcart.
Bill Dustman. Robert Caper. George Gibson. At this time, I invite persons, all of you, any of you, to speak aloud the name of other deceased lost ones who have also died in this past year. We can say them together. This is a time of remembering and honoring those who are still living, who have helped us and nurtured us on our earthly journey. At this time, I invite you to speak aloud the names of those who've been a blessing, those who've contributed significantly to the life of St. Paul's United Church of Christ. And now turning your attention to the bulletin, let us share together in the prayer for All Saints Day. We bless your holy name, O God, for all your servants who having finished their course now rest from their labor. Give us grace to follow the example of their steadfastness and faithfulness to your honor and glory through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. If you are able, I invite you to join in singing hymn number 531, Rejoice in God's Saints.
give it to your folks. I know you all want to. There you go. Come on. Want to scoot on down this way, everybody? All right. You're fine up there. Good. Oh, you can scoot back. Thank you so much for scooting. We'll scoot you back. I guess I'll just turn around here. <laughs> Got to figure out where I'm going to stand this morning. All right, good morning, boys and girls. Good morning. Good morning. Well, you know what? Today we call this All Saints Sunday. All Saints Sunday. You know why we do that? Because all people are God's saints. Do you know what a saint is? A saint is people through whom God shines. People through whom God shines. That's what a saint is. Now, we've got a whole bunch of saints in this congregation today. All these people are saints. But I'm going to call out just, and you are too. You betcha. Now, our choir director is way back here because he's also being our light and sound guy. We desperately need some help with the light and sound. These two guys might take a break some Sunday and not be here. God forbid they would do that. But you miss a great sermon. But anyway, we need more help back there. So... Um, but, but, but Jim is a saint because he directs all these wonderful people here who sing. Linda Hadley's a saint because she stood up here today and was our liturgist. And by the way, she and Glenn are celebrating their 30th wedding anniversary by going on a cruise this week. So the snow will come while they're in the sunshine. You know that's happening. Yes. I cannot believe we didn't make a bigger deal of this. Okay, Andrea's a saint. Because if you ever heard me play on the organ, you would be so glad we have Andrea here. Bob's a saint. He keeps this church running smooth when he's not falling for his wife. <laughs> okay. All right. Rich Spencer back there, he's running the soundboard. He's a saint. Let's see. Doug Spencer? Uh, I'm not so sure. Um, but we do have another saint. We do have another saint right here in front of Doug. How many of you have benefited from the Sunday school teaching of Janet Keller? My gosh, she has taught how many years in this church? So many of you have your faith in Christ because of what Janet taught you in Sunday school. And guess what? That's being passed on by another saint. Her daughter, Amy, teaches our confirmation class, teaches them what we believe in as United Church of Christ folk. And all our Sunday school teachers. So, all these people are saints. All right? And what they do is they teach us more about God and God's love for us. So this week I have an assignment. Oh, I've lost the crowd here. Lost control. Hey, everybody. Let's look up here. Well, maybe not. Okay. I want you to look around for, and to look for God and the people that you're around. Your mom, your dad. Look and see what you might find, and it represents God in each person you meet. Your mom maybe made, made you some breakfast this morning. She cares for you. Maybe your dad played ball with you or helped you with your homework or grandparents took you trick-or-treating. Or we got our teachers at school. We got all sorts of people that surround us that teach us about God. Okay? And all we have to do is look in the hearts of the people around us, see what they're doing. How about you? Huh? Are you a saint? Are you a saint? I don't even know what that means. <laughs> well, you know, that kind of sums up Sunday morning preaching, doesn't it? You know, the old teacher in me always thinks I should do a pop quiz on all of you to see if you really were listening. Okay, can somebody tell me what I just said saints are? People through whom God shines. Let's say that together. People for whom God shines. So we're going to be saints because we're going to shine for God, right? Now, you know what? Out Sitting out there, all those saints, some of those people haven't had anybody touch them or shake their hand or give them a hug this week. This is the opportunity, all right? So let's, let's do it on the count of three. One, two, three, the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Stand up and shake a hand or give a hug or give a high five. All right. Good 
time your dad showed up, I already had that line already. Good morning. What's that? Yes, thank you, little David. I'm trying to watch that. Good morning.
Our scripture reading this morning from the New Testament comes from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 through 23. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Now, if you're able, please stand for the gospel. Reading from chapter 6. Of Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have conceived, received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. And woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. But I say to you that, listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. This is God's holy word for us on this holy day. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. For about three years now, the world of musical theater has been shaken up and given new life by what some people are calling one of the greatest musicals ever written. Of course, I'm talking about the Tony Award winning musical Hamilton, written and composed by Lynn Manuel Miranda. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the musical, Hamilton chronicles the life of Alexander Hamilton one of the founding fathers of our country, the first secretary of the treasury, and the creator of our banking system. 
The narrative begins with Hamilton's arrival in the British colonies only a few years before the start of the Revolutionary War and spans his entire life, culminating in that famous duel between himself and Aaron Burr. Perhaps some of you here today have seen the musical. Anybody here today? Or f yes, and familiar with the music. Yes, you listen to the soundtrack. What's that? Sorry, I was, I was in Milwaukee visiting my 92-year-old mom. And my sister was able to get tickets for she and I to see Hamilton at the Marcus Theater there in Milwaukee. If you listen to the cast recording of Hamilton, we had seven inches of snow, though, so you'd be glad you weren't there. OK, back to this. If you listen to the cast recording of Hamilton, you'll quickly notice that it's very unique and unlike any other musical that you might have heard. The story is told not only through dialogue, but also through a stylistic combination of hip hop and rap and various other styles of music, making it accessible and entertaining to a wide variety of people. But for me, what makes Hamilton even more compelling than the music is one of the most central themes, a theme that can certainly be found in the Gospels as well. We all live. We all die, and our legacy continues through the people that we know and love, the people who will carry us with them in their hearts long after we're gone. The final number of the show perfectly captures this idea that we continue to live on through those who come after us. You see, the finale of Hamilton isn't told from the perspective of the main character, but through his wife, Eliza, who shares with the audience all of the many things that she's able to accomplish in her life after the death of her husband. She keeps his memory alive by sharing his story with future generations and by continuing to do important work in her own life. In that final moment of the show, the company sings the refrain, who lives, who dies, who tells your story? provoking the audience to ponder this question as they leave the theater. Who lives? Who dies? Who tells your story? It seems rather appropriate for us to consider this question on this Sunday we recognize as All Saints Sunday as we commemorate the lives of those who come before us in every generation of the church and contemplate how we might pattern our lives to continue their legacy, a legacy built upon the foundation of countless saints who have committed their lives to following Jesus. All Saints Sunday is not an opportunity for us to dwell upon shortcomings or imperfections of our forefathers and foremothers. None of us are perfect. But All Saints Sunday is an opportunity for us to remember the lives of those everyday saints, average people who have worked hard to lead good and faithful lives worthy of the gospel, people like you and me, each one of us a sinner and a saint, each one of us beloved children of God. Every day, saints have important stories to tell us, stories about falling short and struggling to remain faithful, Stories about sacrifice and self-giving. As members of the body of Christ, their stories and the stories of all the saints who have come before continue on through us. We also have important stories to tell, stories that will surely be told long after our time on earth has come to an end. Our lives are unique to us as individuals because of the stories that we have to tell. And yet, as Christians, we are also a part of a single ongoing narrative, one that began long ago and one that will continue for generations to come. When we commit ourselves to Christ, we add our own individual stories to that ongoing narrative as if we were to insert our own chapter into a book that was already being written. Even though we all lead different lives, we are joined together by that central story. 
the story of Jesus, the one who lived and died and rose again, the one who calls us to share in his death and resurrection through the sacrament of new birth. In our lesson today from the letter of Ephesians that Linda just read for us, the author writes, in Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. Although this letter was written to some of the first followers of Jesus, it is still relevant to us here in the church today. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance. Or put it another way, in Christ, we've been called upon to take our place among the saints, to enter into the household of God, to receive God's gifts of grace and mercy, and to share those gifts with this world. I think this is an important point to make because when we consider the word inheritance, we tend to think about those types of things that are passed down to us from, fam from members of our family, material things that really only benefit us, such as money or property. In other words, it's easy for us to consider an inheritance as something that we've received because of good fortune. But as Christians, we are given a different type of inheritance, an inheritance that isn't really for our own benefit, but for those whom we have called upon to serve. We are called upon to serve. Our inheritance is to work for the building up of God's kingdom on earth, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ Jesus, and to work for justice and peace, that's our inheritance. That is the legacy of the saints, a legacy with which all of us have been entrusted. What will be your legacy? What legacy do you want to leave when you leave this place, this earth, this life? Well, to help you think about that this morning, consider this. What burdens you? Now think about this, what gives you joy? The concept of inheritance is used more than 250 times in the Bible, including those times when the people of God do not want an inheritance that is imperishable, a legacy that lasts. A more altruistic version might be, God, I'll, give, I'll just give all my money away so my family won't fight over it. Like Leona Helmsley, remember her? She bequeathed $12 million to her dog. Surely none of us wants to leave a legacy of spite or bitterness. Might a better legacy be to reconcile with our family, our friends, our loved ones, to meet our death with no resentments, no regrets, absolutely no anger in our hearts. Years ago, there was a woman in a church I once served who asked me to speak with her husband about his mother's death. She said to me, you know, he refuses to go to her funeral. Would you please talk with him, Pastor Rhonda? Well, I did. And when I did, when I told him I was sorry for his loss, anger oozed out of him. And he said to me, well, I'm not going to that funeral because if I do, I'll just start a fight and they'll throw me out. The reason we are asked to write our wills, to make our funeral plans, or consider our pledge to this church is all about legacy. How do you and I want to be remembered? What work do we still have to do so that our hearts will be glad when we die, our spirits rejoicing? Now, I'm not saying this work is easy, but there is help in doing this holy work, help this church can give us. If we cannot help one another with holy dying, how can, we, how can our living be holy? How else can we be the true, authentic, saints 
of St. Paul's UCC. It's not just a literal dying of which I speak. Literal death is simply the last loss, the final letting go. There are all kinds of ways people of faith, especially church people like you and me, hold on when we should be letting go so others can enjoy what we leave for them. One of the things church people are famous for holding on to tightly are their grudges. I don't give to that church anymore, someone might say, because 20 years ago the pastor refused to bury my mother or marry my son or fill in the blank. Is this the kind of legacy we want to leave behind? Or do we want to be known in the next life, even by people who never knew us in this life, as someone who was glad of heart and joyful of spirit. What if at the time of death we said, I've had a wonderful life, full of suffering, but overflowing with joy, and I want to leave a legacy of love, gratitude, and generosity. Sometimes we think our faith in God and in God's people needs some evidence, and that's normal. That's what the disciple Thomas thought he needed. Remember what he said? I will not believe until I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails in my hand in his side. Sometimes we want to believe, but our unbelief needs a bit of help, some encouragement. And sometimes other times are times are times of stronger faith in God. We do not need to see the results beforehand. Sometimes we do not need to have all the numbers of life crunched, crunched in such a way that makes total sense. Sometimes we trust God and each other enough to say things like, St. Paul's United Church of Christ has been a blessing to me beyond belief. Let's step out in faith. Blessed are those the resurrected Jesus says to his disciples, who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Peter says to his friends about their risen Lord, although you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with indescribable and glorious joy. We will all come and go in life. It's true. And yet, amidst the comings and goings, the dyings and risings of our common life, let us not forget this one thing. We inherit this church and our faith in the risen Christ from others, those who have gone on before us, those who are all around us. This is their legacy to us. Just look at the sacred space in which we worship God today. <clears throat> Just look at the works of mercy and justice this church does every single day, reaching out, restoring lives, renewing hope and our joy. For over 170 years, there have been people who have experienced great gladness at St. Paul's UCC. They are witnesses to this resurrection, vessels of joy, models of God's generosity. They have passed their faith, their hope, and their love along to us. A glad heart, a spirit that rejoices, a body that rests in hope, pleasures forevermore. They have left us a legacy. They have passed on an imperishable inheritance. What about us? What will be our legacy? What will we leave to those who go on after us? Now, you know, some sermons extend a gut-wrenching call <clears throat> to dramatically change our lives by embracing the radical nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Other sermons call us to leave behind everything that defines us and follows Jesus. And even other sermons call us to oppose 
social, social injustice and risk our wealth and our reputation in defense of the defenseless. But today's sermon is none of those. Today all I'm making is a simple request, and that is this. Give thought and thanks to those whose lives have blessed you, to those everyday saints, be they family or friends, teachers or preachers, or even blessed strangers. Give thought and thanks to the lives who've gone before you, and in doing so, give thought as to the blessings you will leave to those who follow you. May we all have the grace and the comfort of the Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us along the way. Amen. I invite you to join me now as we move into a time of prayer together. Oh God, we've come to this bittersweet service today filled with a bundle of emotions. While our gratitude for this family of faith is plentiful, our spiritual pain still may be suffocating us at one week, five weeks, four months, three years, or even two decades after the death of our loved, of loved one. Our pews are a little lighter, our homes are a little quieter, and our hearts know well of the gaping hole resulting from our loss. Even as this void still consumes this day-to-day -day living, we come here looking for hope that we can find only in you. Comfort us with our memories. Open us to give you thanks, O oh God, for all the saints who ever worshipped you, whether in cornfields, factories, or cathedrals. Manicured hands and hands stained with grease or soil. Strong hands and those gnarled with age. Holy hands used as wave offerings across the land. We thank you, God, for hardworking saints whether hard-hatted or steel-booted, head-ragged or aproned, blue-collared or three-piece suited. They left their mark on the earth for you, for us, and for our children to come. Thank you, God, for the tremendous sacrifices made by those who have gone before us. Bless the memories of your saints, God, May we learn how to walk wisely from their examples of faith, dedication, worship, and love. Hear us now, God, as together we pray the legacy in prayer that has been passed on to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Today was to be the start of our um, stewardship uh, focus on a wonderful life, um, but it's going to be postponed till next week. But we do have a wonderful life, and we have an opportunity to pass that legacy on to others through our offering. And so I invite our ushers to wait upon us this morning as we receive our morning tithes and offerings, especially on this All Saints Sunday.
Loving God, thank you for these gifts, the opportunity that they may be used to further serve you and be in ministry with all of your people. We ask your blessing now upon them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Before we begin our last hymn, just a reminder, this is the first Sunday of the month. We will have altar communion immediately following the service. Make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In your going out and your coming in, in your lying down and your rising up, in your labor and in your leisure, in your laughter and in your tears, until you come to stand before Jesus in the day in which there is no sunset and no dawning. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. 